This lesson is about Islam in South Asia, and this is part five of a six-part series on the rise and spread of Islam. So we're going to start by looking at India's new invasion, right? And Peter Stearns points out in his book, World Civilizations, that India had a long history of absorbing immigrant groups that were violent and energetic, but were eventually absorbed into India's size and wealth. But this time the Muslims were different. Right? Muslim expansion into India, you know, a lot of this had to do with the growing power of Islam in Afghanistan and Central Asia. Right? And, you know, as we know from the about the fall of the Abbasids and the fall of the Umayyads, these pressure of these Central Asian Turkic peoples, the, the horse people as I like to call them, um, you know, put a lot of pressure on um, the central parts of the Muslim Empire. But there's also spread down through Pakistan into northern India. And so the first wave are these just kind of warriors that are coming in and settling very limited regions and setting up you know, local power structures. And then you also have the Sufis wandering in from Persia and sometimes sailing in from Persia um, and Arabia and you know, setting up their local kind of uh, brotherhoods. And then you just, of course, have traders as well. Remember that theme of the relationship between trade and religion uh, within period three of world history. Um, and, and so, you know, it starts to set up limited presence of Muslim power in this region. You know, and we might pause for a moment and look at the contrasts between Hinduism and Islam, right? Um, and so everything here you know, this is the kind of the Hindu stuff and this is the Islamic or Muslim stuff, right? Uh, a caste system versus a system where everyone is equal in the eyes of God. Remember, egalitarian, the root word is equal. <clears throat> you know, a polytheistic Hinduism versus a monotheistic one God Islam. Remember, Hinduism is an ethnic religion, whereas Islam is a world religion, right? It spreads through conversion. And it has, you know, multiple ethnic, multi-ethnic, multi-regional, multi-racial. Uh, Hinduism is a very flexible religion with localized cults, whereas Islam is a very firm religion where, you know, everyone throughout the world should believe the same thing or pretty darn close to it. Uh, for the Hindus, there are multiple scriptures, multiple holy writings, but for Muslims, there is only one book, the Quran. Right. And so, uh, you know, let me back up for a second. This is a big difference, right? The early, you know, Indo-European invaders who had come into India were just kind of ragtag warrior bunches. They're tribes, really. The Muslims brought with them a sophisticated empire that was highly centralized and highly organized and very unified. And so it was much more of an us against them versus a us coming in and, you know, setting up type of thing. Um, and so it starts under the Umayyads, really. So we're taking a step back right now to even before the Abbasids, right? The Umayyad ca uh, Caliph ordered a punitive expedition on a region known as the Sindh in 711 uh, CE. Actually, it would have come from the water. Um, you know, the, the locals had hurt some, you know, Muslim traders. And so punitive, right, has the root word of punish, Basically, the Umayyads just wanted to punish the locals, um, you know, for getting out of line. But this ended up leading to the Sindh becoming um, part of the Umayyad Empire. And interestingly enough, the the Muslims made Buddhists and Hindus Dimi as well, even though both groups really don't have a book. Remember, Dimi is the people of the book. Hindus and Muslims don't have a book the way Jews and Christians do, but they needed that framework in order to figure out how the the Buddhists and the Hindus would fit in to the Muslim worldview. Um, once again, though, the Umayyads were very tolerant of local cultures and values, and um, you know, locals uh, paid lower taxes and and were held down less than under the caste system. But nevertheless, there were very few conversions in the area, as much because the Umayyads weren't trying to convert them as because the locals didn't want to convert. 
Um, and so we get this mixing of India and, and Islam, right? As I've told you before, there's a huge transfer of mathematical and scientific knowledge um, between uh, India and the Muslim world. And you got to remember too, India was holding a lot on to a lot of older Greek learning too from the time of Alexander the Great. Um, you know, this Hellenistic learning. Um, but, you know, be, again, India is a big place. It's a soft place. It's a comfortable place. And so these mu Muslim rulers ended up uh, adopting a lot of the government and dress styles of the Hindu Rajas. Um, you know, so India almost absorbed Islam, but not exactly. Uh, and then in 962 CE, so this is much later, here come the horse people again right? The Central Asian raiders, um, you know, start to add new territories here um, and eventually push down all the way to southern India and then along the Ganges as well, the Ganges River. And they set up, you know, the, the so-called Delhi Sultanate. Sultan is a uh, Muslim word, an Arabic word. I can't remember what it means. I think it means like ruler or conqueror. Um, but so this was a Muslim run kingdom or even small empire in India. Um, you know, the locals were Hindus, Indians, the rulers were, you know, Muslims, uh, from the West and interesting, inter ugh, interesting, sorry, interestingly enough, uh, the Taj Mahal, which a lot of us, you know, associate with India in our minds that was built by a Muslim ruler, um, not it's not a Hindu building at all, but like I said, you know, there's this, this this process of absorption. Remember, to absorb is that's what a sponge does, right? But we might think more of water being dropped into a bucket of sand, right? The Muslim rulers of the Delhi Sultanate became increasingly Hindu in their dress and tastes. Um, you know, the upper caste Hindus held power in the bureaucracies and kind of looked down on the Muslims, even though the Muslims had power, the, you know, the military power and the power of the throne. It was the bureaucrats who really held the day to day power and they just thought the Muslims were trash. Um, and it turns out that the Muslims ended up developing a caste system where the older families kind of had a higher caste status over newer Muslim immigrants, which totally runs counter to Islamic values where, you know, we're all equal in the eyes of God. Um, you know, and the, the Muslims became aware that Hinduism was mixing with Islam. Um, there were a lot of movements to try to purify Islam by pushing the Hindu elements out, this fear of absorption. And so, you know, this leaves us with some final notes, right? India, like China, was so large and so ancient that it was not as heavily influenced by Islam as the Middle East and North and West Africa were um, because they kind of had this cultural inertia. Inertia is the tendency, actually, let me move that there. Uh, the, um, uh, inertia is the tendency for things to not want to move or to change. Right, um, you know, the India, like China, and I'm gonna talk about this with China in upcoming lessons, didn't wanna change, didn't have to change. It was much more sophisticated. Um, it was older. And we have to remember too, that military conquest does not mean cultural conquest, right? Just because you've beaten me up and taken my land doesn't mean you can change my values or my worldview or my religion. You, you know, you can, chain up my body, but you can't chain up my mind. And that was really the process that was at work here. And it kind of brings us back to the power of culture. I mean, Muhammad understood it, um, you know, and, and the Abbasids understood it. And for some reason, the, the Muslims just really couldn't culturally change India. And because of that, um, you know, Islam did not become as powerful in India as it did within uh, the Middle East. So that's it. Thanks for watching.